from inside the brain to inside the labor movement um, and inside America. Um, so Liz Schuler is the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO. And I think, as you'll find, someone who is unusually cognizant of the changes that are happening in society and how we need to think differently about the relationship between labor and management and business and society. So Liz, first, just tell us how you at the AFL-CIO are thinking about tech-driven change and what the labor movement's role is now vis-a-vis -vis what it may have been in past decades. Well, I'm so excited to be here, first of all, because I've been in the audience for the last couple of days, and I've been hearing uh, so much about all of the innovations and people kind of wringing their hands about what's going to happen to the workforce. And I have news for you. The labor movement, unions, uh, have actually been managing uh, fluidity and dy dynamic talent throughout our history. And we are, I like to say, the original platform uh, for how to uh, upskill folks and credential folks and um, make sure that there's a base of, of t um, highly skilled uh, working people in this country. So we've done this before, and we know how to do it. Uh, so I was excited to be here just for that reason to say, hey, you know, we have a solution, and we've been doing this since the 1800s through every industrial revolution, modernizing and, and uh, evolving and adapting. Uh, so that, to me, is very exciting because, um, you know, a lot of folks feel that there's a mystery in, in the future. And um, I think if we work together and we partner and we... Um, think about working people uh, being at the center of this change and how we can upskill folks. Um, it's not going to be so hard to solve. But is that, I mean, that is clearly not understood as the dialogue proceeds in America. First of all, I don't think the dialogue in America has proceeded nearly far enough about the need for retraining, reskilling, redesigning the education system. Right. But how can we change the terms so that? This discussion is broader so that business and government and the labor movement do work together, which seems like what you're saying would be desirable and, right. and possible. But is it happening now? And how do we get there? It's not happening. And in fact, um, in other countries, it's part of their system. Uh, Germany, a lot of folks point to Germany as a success story. of, um, And the system they have there is tripartite. They have government. They have business. They have labor all working together to solve these problems and having uh, the voice of, of the working people who are you know, on the front lines of the workplace is extremely important. They, they get that. We don't have that system here in the United States. Um, we're working in silos. I hate to use an overused term, but essentially everyone's you know, kind of in their own corners trying to figure things out. There's less collaboration than we find in other places. Um, and so I think that is the... Um, the ideal way to solve problems, and the labor movement is poised and ready to do that. And we have done it. And in fact, I was going to say, in so many instances and in, in sectors across the economy, if you think about the entertainment industry, Hollywood, right? These are all union members. They work on a project basis. Uh, they have a movie, and you know, it's it's a gig, if you if you will. Uh, but they have a way for the employers to come together across an industry and develop a system with the union in partnership to provide stable health care, uh, retirement security. Even when the gig ends, they're still, the, the workforce is still able to access decent wages and health care and retirement security because everyone works together. But, but what's a pathway by which we might get toward a system where the labor movement and business working together could bring that kind of system to more People. Well, that is the trick. Uh, and unfortunately, most people know the labor movement has been shrinking steadily, uh, primarily because of the labor laws in the country make it nearly impossible to form a union. A lot of fear. People get fired. Uh, you know, if they raise their voice in the workplace, it's a risk. Um, so in order to expand access to more people where there aren't unions, uh, we need to figure out a way to um, capture the, the notion of um, leveraging the scale that unions have, for example. Um, I use retirement security as, as a, a prime example where you know, you have a huge pension system here in California. 
how can we actually open the doors to that to make it more accessible to folks who aren't in a union and be able to invest and capitalize on um, the, the leverage that a big pension system provides for their own retirement security, for example. But there are examples of like that across uh, the labor movement where um, that's all workers want is opportunity, opportunity to make a decent wage, to train and upskill um, their credentials, uh, to have access to benefits. Uh, so we need to actually be thinking about, in the labor movement, modernizing um, and working with others to open the doors. Well, one, one interesting thing that, that happened in the last few years is the $15 an hour as a minimum living, it's still very low, but minimum living wage was really something that came out of the labor movement and has now pretty much been accepted as a reasonable floor, but that you didn't get paid any dues for that. In, in other words, is there, a, is there a role that the labor movement, the AFL-CIO in particular, could play more broadly than it has in the past as sort of a national spokesperson, a, an organization, maybe a membership, or, or some kind of civic organization that is a more broader advocacy organization on top of the work you do negotiating contracts with employers? Absolutely. Um, I think, as I said, we have, uh, we know how to work with stable employers where work is constant and we know how to work in these dynamic industries where work is fluid. And this fight for 15, as, as it was called, um, when it first got started, I think people thought they're crazy. You know, $15 an hour, really? Um, and as you said, it's now kind of accepted. Oh, and you know, Jeff Bezos is saying, yes, of course, you know, we need to pay a decent wage. Um, that was not without kicking and screaming. I, I think you know, for, for years, people have been out in the streets um, and raising their voices and trying to push for that change. So it doesn't just happen voluntarily, is kind of how we look at it. Um, but I think, um, you know, again, the labor movement has been there um, you know, for decades thinking about how we provide decent um, opportunity for employment so that you can get a um, pathway to the middle class, feed your family, uh, make sure that, um, again, inequality isn't increasing. And I think that is one big concern with technology creeping in, right? We have all these advancements coming, but we don't have the policies in place to make sure that those um, efficiencies, those productivity gains are actually reinvested into people, the actual people that are still on the planet that are going to be using these technologies. But so, so the labor movement is and can become more of a articulating entity advocate for that sort of way of looking at the world? Well, hopefully we, again, um, we've adapted over the course of all of the other industrial revolutions, thinking about how worker voice and collective action um, looks when the economy changes. And yes, we are at that moment where okay. we have to look at ourselves. Well, there's a promising set of developments separately that I think are worth mentioning. I mean, I'm a baby boomer. I was a proud union member and activist in the mm -hmm. newspaper guild, a unit chairperson. And I mean, I, but my generation generally was not very friendly to the labor movement. Mm -hmm. I think the un, labor move, we, we didn't generally support labor in our work. Uh, however, it seems like the young people today have a much less negative view about the idea of organizing for benefit. And, and if you look at the astonishing developments that have happened in digital media in New York in particular, all these shops you know, that are digital news organizations comprised entirely of millennials and very young people mm. are organizing and joining unions. Um, right. At the same time, you have these walkouts at Google and employee protests at Amazon, Microsoft. There's a kind of a Again, the technology industry under a, a microscope, but b serving as an example that there's a change in the psychology of a certain number of workers in this country right. of speaking up. So what does that mean for you? I think it's exciting, first of all. When I saw the Google walkout, I said, this is like the wildcat strike of the 20s, right? right? Where workers kind of stood up and they said, enough's enough. And if it was on sexual harassment, you know, if it's on wages, whatever the case may be, um, workers are rising up in this country. And, and the teachers we saw 
who were sick of going to their classrooms in West Virginia and, and paying yeah, for a, supplies out of their pockets. Even better example, really, yeah. Um, you see the Me Too movement. I mean, it's, it's an exciting time. Um, and I think that young people today have seen what the economy has done to their parents, where their parents have lost their um, their pensions and you know have had to go back to work after they've retired and that the even democracy isn't working they you know the Harvard study that came out uh, I think late last year about young people today think democracy is actually harmful I mean it was border what 35 percent I want to say um, so that's, that is troubling yeah. right that's and troubling they see this economy not working for them so they innately in their generation I would say if I can stereotype see the benefit of collaboration and coming together for power. And so that translates very easily to the union movement. It will look different though, right? It won't be the traditional model that we've seen where you work for one employer for 30 years and the union office is right there next to the plant. It's gonna be more distributed, it's gonna be perhaps virtual, um, we're gonna use new technological tools uh, to harness that power. Are you seeing that in your membership yet, or is there is there an uptick? What's the what's the state of play? Well, I think that we're at a moment where the labor movement is either going to grow exponentially or continue to to die a slow death and perhaps be reinvented. Um, but I think what I'm seeing out there, what I was saying about the uprisings, is that people are uh, they've had enough <laughs> of the way the economy is broken. Um, they see inequality growing, they see stagnant wages for you know, the last 30 years, and the only way that they can fight back is to figure out um, you know, ways to come together collectively. Um, and in this country, we're so conditioned to think about us as individuals and you know, the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mentality, which is of course important, but at the same time, uh, we can't do everything on our own. Right, we, we do have to come together, and I think Silicon Valley is a great example of that, working in teams and innovating in, in groups, and uh, I think the same is the case for workers in the workplace. Yeah, actually, this whole American thing of the heroic individual may be <laughs> something that is changing, that there is more of a sense of something collective, and the internet probably has a lot to do with that, but I wanna hear what people in the audience and, uh, have to say. I'm sure there's and interesting questions or comments. While we're waiting for a question, I wanna say, in terms of upskilling, to me, that is a prime example of how more and more burden has been shifted to the individual. Yeah. We used to have systems in our country where you know, our, our education systems were, um, you know, the government took more responsibility, or employers took, uh, responsibility for training and upskilling people, and now we're seeing um, individuals at great cost to themselves going down these paths where they're investing, you know, tons of money in these programs, and then they don't have a job at the end of the program, and they're in debt, and I think it's on average thirty thousand um, dollars in debt is what most people are carrying. Now. Yeah, that's yeah, that's got to change. Yeah. Uh, okay, who's got something to to add to this discussion? Over here. Uh, okay. Yeah, hi, uh, Dan Elrond, Accenture. Have you seen any interesting models where employers and unions get together to promote training so the training is portable and the employer doesn't risk losing their whole investment if the employee leaves? Some kind of collaborative system for that? Absolutely. Thanks. Good question. Yes, and in fact, I want to uh, lift up Kaiser Permanente, first of all, um, for their labor management partnership. It's an over 20-year partnership where they have an uh, incredibly sophisticated system where at every level of the company, they have what they call unit-based teams where in um, the hospital, it's from the you know, surgeon or the doctor, all the way through the system of nurses and even transportation professionals, um, where they meet and discuss the most efficient way to execute their day. Uh, so every morning they'll have a team meeting. Um, and I remember once a nurse was saying, you know, I'm the one that's transporting the, the patient after they have their, their procedure uh, because Kaiser wants the experience to be such a good experience that it's like, you know, you stick with the patient throughout the whole process. And in fact, it is so much cheaper to be able to get me back on the floor and have someone else 
move that person um, you know, to, to exit the, the system than it is for a nurse who could be actually on the floor providing uh, care to another patient. So that's an example of a really sophisticated partnership. I mean, they but, figured a way to change that as a result? Yes, they did, and it was all based on the worker feedback because right. you know you have the frontline folks who are, are in the workplace seeing exactly what's going on, and management really not knowing how to create those efficiencies, and it saved millions, right, and provided better care and better outcomes for patients. Um, another industry that's really um, uh, a great example of the way we collaborate in terms of training, I would say, um, is more stereotypical, but the construction industry. Um, which I, I think, again, is the original um, kind of Uber platform, right, for transactions where um, employers knew that in an industry like construction, they're going to need a steady base of talent uh, no matter which employer you are. And so if you need an electrician, you know that you can go to the labor management partnership that the union will train that electrician to the highest standards and that any contractor in the country can draw on that talent pool. And all the while, they're paying into a system where the worker and the employer pay in for the training and also for their retirement and health care. So it's portable benefits, um, what, 1.0, right? And um, that's the union you came out of, in fact. Right, right. that's right, yeah. OK, over here. Yeah, uh, John Madison, Kaiser Permanente. Um, I wanted to ask an unrelated question, and that is, the Institute for the Future has advocated what they call asset equality, and they refer to uh, the Scandinavian countries in particular, where the base of, of uh, free resources, education, healthcare, and so forth, is such that there's much more fluidity in retraining and so forth. Do you see the future uh, being more state-sponsored or more employer-sponsored or some combination? How do you see in our culture approaching the kind of floor that's established in asset equality uh, that enables social mobility, uh, such as the uh, Scandinavian countries? Well, wow, that's an interesting question. And um, I think we're all kind of studying um, the other models overseas, right? Because they do have such a high quality of life uh, in the Nordic countries. And, um, and there's been a lot of talk about universal basic income and what that could portend for the future. And I know there's some experiments going on with that. But I think we believe that really, for the most part, people want to work. They want to have a decent job. They want to have opportunity. And the respect and the dignity that comes with work is worth investing in. And if you think about um, the opportunities we have now to determine the policies and the underpinnings of when, in fact, technology does take off and automation and, and robotics and artificial intelligence do start to displace people, we have a responsibility as a society to reinvest um, you know, some of the profits that we're seeing come out of that increased productivity back into our society. And so you know, I think um, if we don't make the right choices now, uh, that dystopic future that people keep worrying about could indeed happen. OK, on, on a making the right choices now, uh, when we talked on the phone the other day, you were about to get on a plane to go down and campaign for Stacey Abrams. Mm -hmm. the, the, the AFL-CIO has made a major commitment to Democratic Party candidates in this recent election. There's been a huge gain. Uh, how does that change things? Do you require the Democratic Party to have more influence in American society for you to achieve the results you want? And, and have you? Are you more optimistic because of this election that just happened? Well, I, th I think I want to clarify that we are politically independent, right? It just so happens that the issues we care about, um, you know, making a decent future for working people and, and all that, um, you know, members of Congress vote on their voting records end up aligning more with the Democratic Party. So some Republican candidates you yes, do support. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we are bipartisan. Um, but, and I will say that a lot of the attacks that the labor movement have faced come from that stereotype of, of, you know, that if you kill labor, then you kill the Democratic Party, right? So on the Republican side, there's been this anti-labor trend um, all across the country. Um, but we were excited to see working family candidates elected all across the country. And I will say that we had um, over 900 union members actually run for office and win. 
um, or thousands ran, but 901. Um, at all levels of At all government. levels of government, and um, we have a U.S. senator that's a union member. Um, Who is that? Uh, Jackie Rosen from Nevada. Wow. Uh, was a culinary worker. Um, we have 18 members of Congress, uh, two governors, um, wow. and so that was sort of our answer to this, is if you don't like what you're seeing, get off the sidelines and run for office. Is that and, new to have that many elected yes. officials come from the labor movement? It's a big surge, and you've seen it with women candidates, um, post Me Too movement and the Women's March flooding um, you know, into the the uh, arena and so union members as well. So we need political change though to set the groundwork for a lot of the changes you wanna see, I assume. Yes, absolutely, and I would say having working people in those positions of power will help us change the rules of the economy and make it easier, we hope, for workers to be coming together, like you said, in new media and, and other places as the economy grows and changes. Uh, figuring out what that modern labor movement looks like. Well, like I've said several times, inclusion is one of the themes of this conference, Absolutely. and it's a clear example of how that can work and, and should work, and we were, that's why we're so glad to include you in our program and in our video that. that we will distribute after the fact, and uh, want you to keep your good work going. And I want to offer so a challenge to folks here um, that the labor movement is ready and willing to partner at any time, anywhere, to think creatively um, and innovatively of how we upskill the, the workforce of the future and make sure that people still have access to good jobs. Um, and I want to thank the, the folks who are working here. You know, I think backstage and the folks, you know, serving your food and cleaning your rooms and um, the firefighters who are out literally, you know, in danger as we speak. Um, valuing that work and seeing that work as you go through this uh, technological shift. Thank you. Thank you so much.